our playologists have provided you with some play items at your table. They may be on your chairs if you haven't sat down yet. Um, feel free to play and have a good time. I would like to welcome everyone to Glazer Children's Museum and thank you for attending Let's Talk Play. And how about an applause for our flautist, Wayne Mitchell Stryker. <laughs> you did a fabulous job. <laughs> Wayne is a member of our guest services team, so you may recognize his smiling face as one that greets you when you come to GCM. I am Karima Harper. I will be your MC and moderator for today. I am a blogger, content creator, and proud mom of two very active boys. <laughs> My blog, Crafting a Fun Life, is all about motherhood, crafting with kids, local activities, and all cool things that make life fun. If you follow me on social media, you'll see that we love coming to Glacier Children's Museum. I am so honored to be here today and excited to discuss brain building play. And now I'd like to welcome Gigi Kreischer to the stage. Gigi is the chair of board of directors for the Glazer Children's Museum and has dedicated 52 years to early childhood education. Welcome, Gigi. <laughs> And yes, I started when I was 10, okay? <laughs> Thank you all for joining us this morning. It's so exciting to be together to celebrate our second annual in-person Learn and Pray, uh, Let's Talk Play Symposium. And this year, our focus is on the importance of the, how the brain develops from birth to age three. The foundation set during this stage has significant impact on all future academic success and professional productivity, whether you like it or not. We're very, very fortunate here in Hillsborough County to have the Glazer Children's Museum because it's an invaluable cultural and educational asset for our community. Here at GCM, children come to learn through play that which can't be taught. You have little notepads, write that down. <laughs> Through carefully designed play experiences, children absorb and acquire information that they need for life. With a show of hands, how many of you have been around a toddler in the last year? Oh, praise the Lord, we're gonna have a good time this morning. Um, these brave souls understand the function of the human how the human functions birth through three. An infant wants to eat and sleep, only they sort of get it wrong, they want to sleep all day and eat all night, but anyway, they eat and sleep. And then we're so anxious for them to crawl and walk, and once they're mobile, life as you know it is over. Now there's the uh, one-year-old, I call them the human rumbas, they're vacuums. They're all over the place, into everything, and not good at logical decisions. To the adult, every day with a one-year-old is demo day. The two-year-old, my favorite age, um, is right a full-functioning learning machine. Everything is a good idea. Nothing is off limits. They're all eyes and ears. And just a word to the wise, watch what you say, because they're acquiring language at breakneck speed. <laughs> From the time a child is born, all through the early years, they're learning critical information that they need for life. It may appear to you that the ch what the child becomes during this time happens accidentally, maybe a whim of mother nature. Nothing could be further from the truth. The adults in a child's life have a profound influence on the architecture of their brain. And today we're going to learn how to make the most of those precious years and ensure that our little ones go off to preschool with a sound foundation on which to build. Now, we all love this museum, and I have the pleasure of introducing 
our guiding light, our, our pillar, <laughs> our North Star that makes it all happen along with a phenomenal staff. Sarah Cole, the president and CEO of Glazer Children's Fund. She only calls me that because of the hair. <laughs> Thank you, Gigi. Um, you've said so many more things than I possibly could have said about, um, about the museum and about why we're here today. Um, it's so wonderful to have other people up telling the story, so I don't have to today. Um, we have amazing people for you to listen to. We are the premier children's museum in our area. And I'm saying that proudly because there are other children's museums. They're amazing and wonderful. We are absolutely a destination for families, for schools, for caregivers to come to play with their children. We offer playful opportunities that foster family connection and brain building opportunities. I've been in the children's museum field for 25 years now. Um, <laughs> And I've seen this monumental shift in how we have talked about play. Play has always been core to children's museums, but it was always very, oh, and we do play, but it's for learning. And now we are really boldly, boldly owning the fact that play is the basis of all learning. Play is the basis of all development for children. And so we are proudly standing up and saying, we do play, and we do it really, really well. I am so excited to introduce our speaker today. You guys are gonna get a chance to hear from our amazing speaker and from one of our own in-house play experts, our very own Pam Hillestead, who's our VP of Play and Learning, is gonna help share some wonderful tips for you guys. I would like to thank the members of our board of directors who are here today. You guys just met Gigi, but we've got other board and committee members. So if you are part of the Children's Museum Board and or serve on one of our numerous support committees, please stand up and we'll give you a little round of applause. <laughs> that kind of support coming out and, and really representing and helping us celebrate this day is fantastic. Um, we are so honored to have such an amazing board. I would also like to take a moment to thank all of the GCM staff in the room who transformed this space from a very messy post-camp area into the beautiful event that you're seeing right now. So I won't make you all stand up, but if we could please give a round of applause for the staff. Thank you. I would also like to thank all of our sponsors for this event. This is a wonderful opportunity for you guys to learn about play, but it is a fundraising event. We all know why we're here. But we want to thank all of our sponsors who have helped make today possible and helped continue to make our mission possible. And now I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Joanna Cordemanch is an experienced extin extension bilingual agent for the University of Florida serving the greater Tampa Bay area. She leads community-based educational programming for families and early childhood education providers, as well as the community at large to meet the needs of diverse populations. She teaches the Better Brains for Babies curriculum developed by the University of Georgia Extension in both English and Spanish it's an initiative aimed at promoting the awareness and education about the importance of early brain development in infants and young children. Joanna's research background includes a master's in public health focused on human relationships, family and child development, and mental health. She is also a new mother, so she is not only well-versed in theory, but well-versed in practice now. <laughs> New mother to three-month-old Callahan. This is where I go off script and give a mad props to this woman who signed on for this knowing that she was about to go on maternity leave, developed all of this while with a brand new baby at home, and has agreed to come here early this morning uh, to be with us. Uh, so three-month-old Callahan, who is not able to be with us today, we did invite him, <laughs> but it's okay, because we know that that, that happens. So I would love to hear you all to give me a round of applause to welcome Joanna.
Thank you so much, Sarah. Can everybody hear me? Good morning. How's everybody doing? Such beautiful faces today. Y'all make it because it's so easy for me to do my job. I wake up at 5.30, snooze my alarm, thinking, you know, I got five, ten minutes more. Callahan doesn't have to wake up yet. Yeah, that didn't happen. Um, and apparently the part of the brain um, where you commit to things is not really fully developed in my husband yet. So that's why he's not here either. Um, but anyhow, I'm super excited to be here with you guys this morning. And I want to talk a little bit about why play matters. And in extension research, there's a lot going on. So I want to dive into it. So by a show of hands, how many of you guys think that this is a myth? And how many of you guys think that this is a fact? 90% of brain development happens by the age of three. So how many of you guys think that this is a myth? He laughs. That's funny. Myth, one person. How many of you guys think that this is a fact? Most of the room. Well, it is actually a myth. So for you, sir, that you're <laughs> laughing back there, thank you. Um, so what's actually going on is that the brain has reached its 90% uh, of its weight by the age of three, but it hasn't fully developed until the age of 25, and 90% of it happens by age five. So interesting little tidbit there. But what we know is that research is constantly changing. And brain research tells us a lot about what's going on, especially in early childhood. So the brain is not fully developed at birth, although there is a lot happening in utero. Um, there are important foundations that do happen by the age of three. And one of those is um, experiences, right? And that's why we're here to talk about why play is so important. So we do know that experiences shape the brain. And I don't know if you guys have heard um, this phrase, experiences shape the brain, but it's quite literally shaping the brain. Um, so these early positive interactions with supportive adults are going to be essential for a child's brain development. Now, how exactly does the brain develop? And I know you guys are looking at the screen like, whoa, she's going to get super technical, but I'm going to break it down for you, don't worry. So it's a five-step process, right? Neurons are formed. Uh, prenatally, and there are billions and billions of neurons that are forming. Now, these neurons migrate into different positions in the lobes of the brain. Now, in these lobes, neurons are covered by what is called a myelin sheath, or a myelin coating. And this is made up of fatty acids, and these fatty acids are going to protect... There we go. It's going to protect this spaghetti-like part of the neuron called the axon. Now, this axon covered by the myelin sheath, like I said, it's made up of fatty acids, and that is why uh, women who are pregnant are encouraged to eat a lot of fatty acids during pregnancy, right? All of your avocados, your nuts, your salmon, all these great things. Now, that was really fun while I was pregnant. Um, it just gives you an excuse to eat, really. So, um, this myelin sheath is going to be essential, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but... Um, the fourth step, synapses are being formed, but they're also going to be pruned. Now, you guys are looking at me like, what exactly is synapsis? Well, there's a process called synaptogenesis. And synaptogenesis is this process where our brain is making tons of connections based on the experiences that we are surrounded by in our environments, right? So this is going to happen very rapidly prenatally, but it's also going to be influenced in those first few years of life. And 50 trillion synapses are formed only at birth, all right? So a lot is going on um, during those first few years. Now, 1,000 trillion are formed by age one. So imagine this, we're going from 50 trillion to 1,000 trillion. That's a lot of things going on up here, right? And you think babies are so cute, they really don't know what's going on. No, like there's a lot going on, trust me. So. The connections that are used regularly are going to become stronger. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about play, but connections that are made stronger are due to those experiences in play that's happening. Now, at the same time, there's also pruning going on. So synaptogenesis, making connections. Pruning is refining those connections, telling our brain what information we need and what can be tossed, right? What can be thrown away? Now, it's a necessary part of brain development, but as we age, our brains become a lot more efficient at pruning, right? 
deciding what information it is that we need and what information it is that can be tossed. Now, brain development is a constant wiring process. There's a lot going on. I saw a video not too long ago about a uh, psychiatrist who talks about the difference between men's brains and women's brains, and I won't get too into it. But he really talks about how men are usually in the nothing box, and they just go there every time their wife speaks or they are listening to something they don't really want to listen to. Um, but women's brains are, you know, they're always going on, and they connect this thing to that last summer vacation that we took and Thanksgiving to that one time you didn't do that one thing that I didn't want you to do. So it's crazy. Um, but it's this constant wiring process, and it's biologically driven. And as a matter of fact, our genetics do play a very big role in this uh, brain wiring. But what we do know, um, based off of brain research, is that repetition and um, is going to strengthen um, this brain wiring, right? And that's why repeating things, especially during play, is so important. Now, let's break it down by age. So in this newborn um, period, this is a very rapid uh, period for brain growth. And I was reading an article that talks about how if the brain um, continued to develop at this rate, by the time it is finished developing at age 25, it would weigh one ton. That's crazy, right? Imagine us walking around with like one ton brains, like, you know, our heads are so heavy we can't even hold them up. It'd be crazy. Um, but this is the time in our life where basic survival skills and reflexes are being made through those strength and connections. And neurons begin to make trillions and trillions of more connections. So it's constant. It's a constant wiring process. Now, during the early and middle childhood development, this is where play is going to start becoming a bit more complex, right? We want to challenge children um, according to their age. But complex networks are constantly forming and making these connections. Now, myelination, which is what I talked about earlier, that fatty coating that's going to protect the axon, is going to increase and help the child reach its adult brain size. Now, this is why good nutrition at this age is so important, because it's going to help that myelination. Um, pruning is also going to increase brain efficiency. But as we age a little bit more, we get into that adolescent phase, right? And in this adolescent phase, myelination continues in that frontal lobe. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that the frontal lobe is the last part of the brain to develop. Like I said, it finishes developing until age 25, but this is exactly why teenagers, they don't make the best decisions, and they hate you. I really hope Callahan doesn't get there anytime soon, but we'll see. Um, now, this lobe is the most influenced by experiences and the least influenced by genetics, all right? So the frontal lobe lasts to develop, but the support of adults in a child's life you are going to influence this lobe the most. Now, how can that happen? Well, there's a term called plasticity, and it kind of refers to the brain being uh, malleable, right? Being so plastic that we can actually shape it. And I talked about this um, earlier, about shaping the brain. Now, how many of you guys have heard the term, oh, kids are sponges, right? They really are. They absorb a lot of information, and I know Gigi mentioned this. Um, but plasticity actually decreases with age, and that's why you see a lot of people prone to Alzheimer's, prone to dementia, um, because their plasticity is decreasing and they're not exercising their brain. Now, experiences, especially experiences through play, are going to have a greater effect on more plastic brains because they are easily influenced. Now, both positive and negative experiences are going to have an effect, but unfortunately, the brain can't distinguish between positive and negative at this age. So things that are negative can lead to toxic stress. Now, how many of you guys have heard the term adverse childhood experiences? Most of us here in the room, right? Yep. So uh, because the brain cannot distinguish between the two, it can lead children to adverse childhood experiences. And I'll get to that in a second. But... This is why those first five years of life are so important, because children are undergoing these sensitive periods. Now, the brain can change the most during these sensitive periods, but sensory input is essential, right? And this is where play comes in. 
because it's essential to use all five senses working the brain in order for the brain to strengthen those neural connections, which is going to happen during these sensitive periods. Now, synapsis is going to take place and strengthen them, um, but change is going to be more difficult as the child ages. Now, it's not impossible. Some of you guys are like, well, you know, I have a teenager and I didn't do those things with my kid. It's okay. Don't worry. Um, I, was, I was speaking to a young lady earlier, and she was like, I, you know, I'm taking so much information. Everyone's giving me advice about, you know, my child being pregnant. It's a lot. I get it. Yeah. I, I don't know who I was kidding when I was like, yeah, I'll bring Callahan, wake up at 530. I, I don't know. Anyhow. All right, so experiences influence the brain, right? Now, the role that we play as adults is providing enriching and challenging experiences. So we want to make sure that they're developmentally appropriate. Now, through experiences, children can reach these developmental milestones. And I'm sure all of us have heard about the developmental milestones set out by the CDC. Um, but through experience and play is the only way that children are going to be able to reach this, right? They need our full attention. Through, through those first five years of life, they depend on us 100%. Now, earlier I talked about um, leading children to toxic levels of stress. And in this last bullet point, you can see how negative experiences can have a damaging effect on the brain. So there are three levels of stress, positive, tolerable, and toxic. Positive is going to be your daily life stressor, tampa traffic, things as such. Now, tolerable stress, it's going to be one level up, right? It's something that you can probably overcome. You're not really sure if you have money to pay X bill. But then you have toxic stress. And this can be anything from going through divorce, separation, the incarceration of a parent, the loss of a loved one. These are all things that are going to lead to an adverse childhood experience. And studies show that people that have undergone more than three adverse childhood experiences are going to be your people that are going to struggle into adulthood, right? They might have mental health issues. They might have um, issues keeping a stable relationship, keeping a job. Now, in order to avoid this, what is the role that we play? Well, think of a tennis match, right? In a tennis match or a ping pong match, the ball has to keep going back and forth in order for the game to continue. This is the same role that we play as adults through these serve and return interactions. Without these serve and return interactions while we're playing with children, they cannot learn these essential skills and strengthen those neural connections. So what is it that we can do, right? Something as super simple as making eye contact, giving my baby my full attention, giving my child my full attention. How many of us are guilty of, hey, no, what's going on? Yeah, no, the kids, they're here. They're just giving me a hard time. I told you to stop. We're all guilty of it, right? All the distractions in our lives, especially with technology, it's a great thing but it can also be hindering to our child's development. Now, touching, giving verbal responses, um, and using varied facial expressions, these are all things that are going to help uh, our child's sensory input. So what we know is that uh, play builds connections in the brain, right? Through play, children can learn a lot. Now, children need these sensory experiences, and we know that neural connections are strengthened when we let them experiment on their own when we reinforce and expand the skills that they're already learning, they're not going to get to school for a while, right? So these first five years, setting them up for that success is super, super important. Now, let's break it down by uh, age. So between ages zero and one, this is where the brain begins to develop these sensory abilities that I've been talking about. This is where uh, your vision and your sound are going to start becoming sharper. Now, Callahan's eyes, he got a new set of eyes like last month. Let me tell you, that boy is distracted. And I got LASIK, oh, crazy. But in this period where vision and sound start becoming a lot sharper, he's been looking at me a little funky. I went from Charlize Theron and Monster to Charlize Theron and Hollywood Glam. Yeah, so he's been looking at me a little different. But this is when... That period is taking effect. Now, <laughs> ages one to two, 
This is where things are going to start becoming a bit more complex, right? So the limbic system is working to process our emotions. The frontal lobe is starting to process choices, higher order thinking, decision making, and problem solving skills. Now, this is going to be very important um, for emotional intelligence. The cerebellum is also working to control our movement and our hand-eye coordination. Everybody knows that toddlers are super clumsy, right? Yeah, that's this working. Now, ages three through five, this is going to be the fastest growth period for that frontal lobe that's going to be in charge of those higher order thinking skills. Now, this is also going to be a time where there's a lot of processing going on. And remember I talked about those neural connections and that myelin coding? Well, there's a lot of signals being pushed out. And without that myelin coding through good nutrition, there cannot be electrical signals sent to these neurons, right? That uh, myelin coding is acting as the insulator. Now, play involves complex themes. This is where you're going to have a lot of different um, play. It's going to be more complex, and you're going to challenge children a lot more during these um, times. But this is going to be the most sensitive period in those first few years, ages three through five. Now, what exactly do children need for play? Well, they don't need us to do it for them. How many kids have you played with that they're like, no, mom, stop. I, I want to do it. I wanted to close the door, right? They don't need us to do it for them. They just need us to facilitate. We are there as facilitators. Don't do it for them. Question, if this happens, what do you think is going to happen later on, right? Cause and effect. They need us to tinker with them. They need us to get their brains active, they need that brain wiring to constantly be sending those signals. They need us to provide experiences and play that challenges them. They need us to bring them to the Glacier Children's Museum. <laughs> right? That's going to be my line when my husband's like, I don't know. No, we got to bring Callahan because, you know, we're going to team up. Anyhow, through play, there's one crucial part that I can't stress enough, and that's consistency. Children need consistency, right? Without this consistency, they're going to get into those toxic levels of stress. They need predictable uh, schedules, they need predictable routines, but they also need predictable play. Now, that's not saying that you can't challenge them through play, but they need to know what's coming next. This is going to help reassure them. This is also going to build resiliency, it's going to help them build independence, and it's going to help them be better problem solvers later on. Now, I had mentioned emotional intelligence, and this is a fairly new concept, but consistency is going to help them build up emotional intelligence, and this will help them with identifying their emotions later on, but it's also going to help them with controlling their emotions through that self-regulation, right? Identifying their emotions and being able to self-regulate. Now, if you didn't listen to any of what I said, just, just take these home with you. So some key takeaway messages. Research is continually happening on the brain, right? And as it continually happens, one thing that is going to remain consistent is that healthy brain development is essential for children. And the role that we play as adults is going to be very crucial. We are very influential in their lives. So what do they need? Their basic needs need to be met, right? They need good health. They need positive interactions, not just with supportive and loving adults, but they need positive interactions with other children. They need to build those social skills, those language skills. Now, they also need safe and secure environments and opportunities to explore, and that's what we're going to provide through play. Now, what are some other things that we can do, right? Some tools and techniques to take away. Ensure that there's good physical health, as well as safety and good nutrition, right? Because that's going to um, provide them with a good basis in that brain wiring. We need to respond sensitively and consistently to their needs, right? We need to talk, sing, and read with them. And those are all things that you can do here. Um, we need to create opportunities for plor uh, sorry, play and exploration. And the most important thing is repeat, 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 right? Repetition and consistency are very important for children. And that's why play is important. Thank you.
Wow, that was a lot to think about. Um, I really enjoyed um, the session. I, my takeaways from it is children need you to talk, sing, and read. Maybe not sing all the time. My kids do not like when I sing. <laughs> I think I have the best voice, but they do not, so they try to limit my singing, and that's fine. <laughs> um, children need good health and positive interaction with adults and also other children. That was a good takeaway. And another one that I enjoyed was Repeating things during play is so important. For me, I thought, you know, let's move on to something else. <laughs> but my kids really enjoy the, the routine of doing the same thing. And now that you mentioned it, I know it's important to do. So thank you for sharing that with us. Now, let's dig even deeper into the topic with a conversation between Joanna and our play expert, Pam Hillestead. <laughs> Pam is the Vice President of Play and Learning at the Glazer Children's Museum. She's a 28-year veteran of the Department of Defense Education Activity and a two-time Teacher of the Year. That is great. <laughs> she has a Bachelor's of Arts in English from St. Olaf College and a Master's of Arts in Educational Leadership and Curriculum Development from Framingham State University. Pam has always lived a life of play that includes skiing in the Alps, that's cool, <laughs> and swimming in the Adriatic Sea. And even though she has never needed an excuse to play, she now has one more with the addition of her first grandchild. <laughs> Pam joined the team at GCM in 2017, where she takes a play-based approach to leading the education department. The team can always count on Pam to keep things playful and fun. <laughs> Welcome, Pam. <laughs> Just gonna do a quick reset so that everyone over here can see. We're gonna pull this back. Is this all? Okay. All right. Hello. Everyone can hear me? All right. Perfect. So, for my first question for Joanna, what kind of impact can negative experience or not playing with children have on brain development? Definitely. Thank you for the question. So. I had mentioned earlier about adverse childhood experiences, and I'm sure Pam is very familiar with them. But like I had said, through these adverse childhood experiences, the more the children are exposed to them, the more detrimental effects that they can have. Um, I had mentioned that having three or more ACEs can actually lead to a lot of negative effects. Um, studies have actually shown that um, having three or more adverse childhood experiences can lead to mental illnesses, um, such as multiple personality disorder, even things such as being fired from a job because you can't really keep a stable job, having a difficulty um, building relationships, all these things, right? So the less that we expose children to stress and keep them on predictable schedules and keep them consistent, the more that we can avoid that. Can I, can I just add that in the early childhood community, one of the things that we've been really talking about in the last couple of years is the fact that the, the COVID experience has been very similar to an ACEs experience. Right. And in the community, there's been a great deal of talk about how, how difficult it is for children and how difficult it was for children and the need to respond in these ways to help them get rid of that stress that came from COVID. And I think even, you know, just the stress of e-learning for that whole year, right? Everybody yeah. went through that stress. Absolutely. Parents, oh, forget it. Yeah, that, was, um, that was tough. That was very stressful, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you have any suggestions um, for ki kids that were struggling during that, the year of COVID and 
virtual learning? Do you have any suggestions for parents or caregivers? Play, play, play. <laughs> I, there, there is, and, and not just for children, right? I think one of the things that we forget is that adults also need to play. And uh, having that play opportunity as stress release, one of the things we did here at the museum, at, most of you know, we opened very early. We opened in June of 2020, reopened. And one of the things that we did then was we set up a new program called the Family Play Project. And instead of us being the experts, we were the facilitator, the guide on the side, giving parents and families that opportunity to tinker together, as Joanna was talking about, that, f that space. And one of my favorite things to say to parents is, no, 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 don't clean up the mess. We've got it. You know, that come is here lovely. Take a break, right? <laughs> take a break. We've got the mess. Take a break. Play, enjoy with your child, and learn something too, right? And you bring up a good point with the family uh, quality time that is being spent through play, right? It's not just play for the adults and play for the kids. Think about the quality time that is uh, being built upon and strengthening family connections as well, that family dynamic. Yes. Okay, my next question for you. At what age do sensitive periods occur? And how can you help um, adults and caregivers um, with that during that time? Right, so I did mention those first five years of life are very crucial, but the most sensitive period is going to be ages three through five. Now, like I said, if you didn't do that, don't worry. <laughs> um, I know Anisia, she had mentioned, you know, I have an 11 year old, hopefully I'm not too late, it's okay. okay. Um, but even through those teenage years, I think there's also a very great influence. Um, although the brain isn't easily uh, as influenced during that time, right? Because they're gonna be a little bit more defiant. Um, it's still not as influenced by genetics than it is by experiences. And it's, so. it, I was thinking as I was listening with that first part about the brain isn't fully developed until 25. The minute you said it, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. Because I, rem I, I raised two boys and I remember oh, yeah. that period of time where I was like, okay, if I can just get them to 25, if I can just get them to 25, <laughs> because, because of that. And I think the, the power in those kinds of things, again, experience, experience, any of the, the um, the times that you can spend more with your family, with your children, together doing things, that helps in any of those sensitive periods. Definitely. And I did mention men's brains and women's brains are wired differently. I just turned 25 in May, so I'm like over the hurdle. I'm super qualified to be up here talking to you guys. Absolutely. So let's just throw that out there. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, yeah, my boys are like 28 and 31, and I, I'm now breathing a sigh of relief. I married a They're guy good. 24 years older than me. It, it took him a while to get that frontal lobe really, really developed, but we'll see. Um, do you think social media has made a change to any of that, especially for the teen years? I do, definitely. I think it can have actually a positive and a negative impact, don't you think? Absolutely. I, I, I do. I think it's, it, it's a subject that needs to be talked about all the time. And one of the, one of the organizations that we work closely with is called Rooted in Play. They do loose parts play all over the Tampa Bay area. And they ha if you don't follow them on Instagram, you should. But one of the conversations they've been having in the last six months is, is computer time, are computer games, does that count as play? And it's so interesting because it's important to discuss, kids are doing those kinds of things, so how do you find the games that are playful and how do you find the games that are helping them with resilience and helping them you know, construct new things or make new connections, not just that linear kind of feeding me thing. So social media, I feel a it's a little bit harder for me to, to justify because I think there is, especially in the middle years, I think there is a lot of toxic stress that can come from social media, the, uh, the standards that are set for young people. But I also think it's an opportunity to dialogue with your children. And if at a very early age you've set that experience that you talk, then you can do it when they're teenagers too and talk about why this is a negative experience, this, you know, seeing this measure or this standard on social media. Right, and 
and I think nothing can replace manual play, right? Now, there are other um, resources through technology, but social media is just a whole different ball game. You've got kids doing TikTok and kids doing all kinds of things. Um, but it's also a way for them to socialize. I don't know if you guys watch the Today Show, but just the other day I was watching something. They were talking about how two little boys met from two different sides of the country, and they met up through TikTok. And although a little bit scary, um, but it's very interesting because it also provides them with that social aspect. Um, so I think it's very interesting. Yeah, so we, since when we started with COVID, we um, were one of the very early organizations to join um, a, what's the name of the organization? I'm sorry, the, what? Zigazoo, thank you. It was in there somewhere in my brain. <laughs> so, she was fetching it out. <laughs> yeah. Zigazoo is like a TikTok, but it was created by educators, and it is it's very safe for children. It's, it, they have Zigazoo Classroom, and we regularly post challenges on Zigazoo uh, and ask uh, children questions, and then children all over the world respond in their own videos. And so teachers will add, add our challenges, and it's, it's been really an interesting experience. We're so proud to have been one of the early channels, and now we have so many subscribers. Yep. That's been a really, really valuable thing. And I, I, again, about the social interactions, I think very, very important. Uh, tools used correctly. Thank you yeah. so much. And my last question for you, I know you mentioned that um, for kids to make it challenging but not overwhelming, do you have any suggestions for parents and caregivers or educators? I think it just depends on the child's age, right? We want to make sure that it's developmentally appropriate. Um, now, the play that you're going to see for a young child age five is not going to be the same for a teenager, right? Um, but there's no better place to do that than the Glacier Children's Museum, guys. Like, I don't work here, but seriously, they've got some really good outlets and resources for families, um, and I'm sure they are developmentally appropriate. They are. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I think there is a lot of pressure on, on parents, the whole, you know, parenting correctly or, you know. Gentle and parenting. Yes, and, there, yeah. there's so much pressure out there, but I think it's important to remember that it is experience and it is repetition. And my favorite play opportunity is cardboard box play. All of us who've had children know that when you open presents, the present that's in the box is played with for a little while. Yeah. But the box is way cooler. Why is the box way cooler? Because it can be anything, right? right. And th those are the opportunities. You know, you don't have to have these wonderful play kitchens. You can have a cupboard that has the, you know, tools in it that are usable for a child, you know? It, you don't have to, and really, anybody who needs resources, ideas, we would love to talk about it here at the museum anytime. That reminds me of when I was younger. I'm one of five, and we had over-the-top imagination. <laughs> Play came natural to us. I know it's not that for many people, but we would use things around the home, and we would play games like that we would see on TV, like Let's Make a Deal. Yeah. Yes, we played that as kids. <laughs> and Will of Fortune, we would take these little sticky tabs and yeah. put it on this thing that my grandmother had, flip it over, and spin it. So we would find different ways to use things at home to use our imagination. So I feel like parents, you can do things like that. You don't have to necessarily buy something expensive, use what you have at home, and kids will have a great time with that. And you don't have to be, I think there's um, a misconception that you need to be down on the floor playing with your child, and that's not necessarily what we're looking for. What we need is to facilitate that play. So maybe it means setting out the cardboard boxes and then letting them play. If you play with them all the time, they're not learning things on their own. They're not discovering, they're not problem solving. Give them some space, but facilitate that play. Right, they're not gonna learn that cause and effect. How many of us had scrapes and bruises growing up? You know, <laughs> you don't see that. Technology is not gonna give you that. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Um, but yeah, it's through that imagination, um, and like you mentioned, 
we're acting only as facilitators. We're helping them question that brain wiring is going to be a consistent thing, but without us facilitating, they can't, they can't do that, right? Um, and you also mentioned that we don't necessarily have to play with them all the time, right? They're going to learn that cause and effect if we give them the tools to do so, right? So we're just there to give them a little toolbox and they can fish out what they need. I wanted to say yeah. one more thing about repetition too. I, I'm 60 years old, but I still remember all the words to a couple of the Dr. Seuss books. I know all the words to Good Night Moon because you have to read those books over and over. I mean, yep. you finish a book and they want it again. And to understand why that's important, you know, the adult, absolutely, you could be bored of it. Doesn't matter, but you're giving them that repetition. They want to know, oh, you turn the page this way. Oh, there's Elmer or you know, whoever it is. And just like you have to exercise for physical health, your brain needs exercise too, and that's what repetition is doing. That's good. So thank you so much, Pam and Joanna. I really enjoyed this fireside, ch fireside chat. Um, now that we had a chance to tell you about the importance of play, it's time for us to show you. Please turn your attention to the screen for a few minutes of play and inspiration for one of the families that we serve. Megan Carter, the mom of the, the Carter family of five, almost six, and um, I'm a pediatric dentist and we love coming to the Children's Museum. I am Colby Carter and the father of the Carter clan, and I'm a, a physician assistant turned PA for a, a professor and also now a stay-at-home dad. Glacier Children's Museum is, is a big part of our lives and playing with our children. When I was a kid, um, and even now, my, my dad especially would always get on the ground with us, roll around with us, you know, toss us in the air. So that, it, it's so great because that actually continues not only in our family, in our Carter family, that we get to still do those things with our children and we interact with our children those same ways, but also that the grandparents interact with their grandchildren that way still. So, so they're getting that, that physical love, they're getting that just emotional time with, with all of us. So I think it really helps build up our children to, to see that you can have fun while you're playing, and also you can build strong family units with that play. We love spending time at the museum and Learn and Play is an integral part of our week. Every single week, different locations. It's just a blast. When we go to the Learn and Plays, it is the perfect family time. It's great to like play all together, but then also seeing them be independent and be comfortable. We realize that we're very fortunate that we both have the flexibility in our schedules to be able to go to these events and, and you know do the learn and plays, come to the museum. We have a lot of family support in the area, which we understand a lot of families have, but also a lot of families don't have. It's so nice that the learn and plays go out into the communities so that it is something more accessible to those people who are looking for more time with their children or grandchildren, but maybe can't make the drive to downtown and then the free Tuesdays, we take advantage of those. Anybody can take advantage of those. And with both of those things, we see that there's so much diversity. We, we definitely uh, appreciate the fact that we have our children playing with children with different backgrounds. And just like I said, just being able to do that at no cost to the families. The Glacier Children's Museum has done a fantastic job 
cultivating an inclusive environment. It's just a wonderful resource for the community. I think it's important to support the museum because of how involved the Glazer Children's Museum is in the community. So by supporting this museum, you're supporting the families of Tampa. You know, having the access to go to Learn and Plays and the free Tuesdays. The only way that they're able to do these things in the community is from the community support. You are are giving a little piece of your heart to that. You're giving, you know, a little piece of you to say, this is what I stand for. This is what I care about. I care about moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, spending time with their loved ones. I care that every child, no matter what their background is, they have an opportunity to learn and to be successful. I think it's really essential that, you know, the, the families of Tampa support the families of Tampa. And so donating to the Glazer Children's Museum, that's the way to do it. Thank you guys so much for your attention. We're gonna sit right now because um, Megan is a real person, by the way, <laughs> um, not a paid actress. And Friday, we heard Friday. Friday. Friday so we're gonna let Megan sit for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. So I I wanted to take a second just to thank you so much for sharing your family with us. Not just for this video, but um, if you guys are familiar with us. You've seen these babies everywhere. <laughs> Frankly, the most photogenic family on the planet. But also, again, just such real super users. And you guys are you guys are here for everything and such a part of it. So, you know, you said so much in that beautiful video, but I didn't know mm -hmm. if there was anything else you wanted to share with us. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for being available to us. I mean, I think there's there's resources out there, and um, just being able to take advantage of them is fantastic. Like you said, we are super users. We <laughs> come to the free Tuesdays. We go to the Learn and Plays, and um, we go to multiple locations of the Learn and Plays, so we can be there. Um, my husband's a stay-at-home dad, so he's there three or three times a week, maybe four times a week, just depending on um, you know what the schedules look like. So um, yeah, so thank you to Glacier Children's Museum for being available to us and giving us a resource. It's just, I have a lot to say, so I, I won't say I it all, it. but I love it. Um, there's, there's, there's things that didn't get said in the video, which um, we talked a lot about play heritage and how you pass your play down from families, um, from your parents to you and then so on. Um, but there's also, I think, parenting heritage. And um, that is something that when you go to the learn and plays, you're not only interacting with your children, but you're interacting with other families. And so you're getting to watch other parents talk to their children and hear how they talk to their children. And so one of the things that I've learned from my sister-in-law is when kids are trying to play with the same toy, um, instead of saying, which is what I learned growing up, was stop fighting over that. Instead, it's, um, oh, what are you trying to share? <laughs> and it's just reframing things like that. But yeah. I don't think you really, as a parent, you don't get exposed to that so often. You just know what you, you've you learned and, and that's that. So mm -hmm. being able to just get that exposure to other parents in yeah. the community is awesome too. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we talked about during our conversation is, you know, parenthood can be incredibly isolating in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, you know, especially with really young children. It's, it's you and the babies and that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having opportunities like our learn and play sessions, like our Sunshine Sunday, mm -hmm. just, just frankly coming to the museum or other places to have meetups with other parents mm -hmm. becomes such a, a wonderful social moment for us as adults yes. and as parents to to learn from each other, to support each other, to commiserate sometimes. Oh yeah. And you know, to the point of what we were talking about earlier, to allow the kids to play with each other and build mm -hmm. those social relationships while we're 
building and affirming our own social relationships, which are so important for our kids to see mm -hmm. that we have social relationships outside of them. Absolutely. So you know, so many of those things just continue to come together. And again, through that vehicle of play, which is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. You have another question? No, I don't. Okay. I um, <laughs> yeah, so, and then, um, you know, it's always so fantastic to be in the community and such. And um, as a pediatric dentist, I have families who I'm telling to them all the time, I'm like, where does your kid go during the day? Oh, you stay home with them. Okay, great, do you know about the learning place? <laughs> so, and then my husband's out and about at the zoo or whatever, and he's like, oh, do you guys know about these, these awesome, it's just, it's such an amazing resource that, mm -hmm. you know, the word of mouth out there, we try to spread the word because we know how important it is to us, so we try to get others on board with it. Um, so it's fantastic. And I'm going to put something on you. Oh, no. I would love to see more learn and plays <laughs> available <laughs> because I think that, you know, even this summer it was insane. They had to turn people away because They're there busy. were so many kids there yeah. and so many families. Um, but having more access to it, mm -hmm. I think it'd be great for the community yeah. and having some sort of transportation voucher, I think would be great. Too. Oh, so where's my city people? Just, I got city I people you, in the I'm audience. Let's talk. You. <laughs> um, because I, you know, I have families at the office who, um, I have, you know, yeah. kids who are struggling with speech and language, yeah. and they stay home with a grandparent all day long, every day of the week, and so they don't get exposed to as much language as they right. could. And, you know, there's grandparents who don't drive. Mm -hmm. And so having something like that, that could give them the access um, to those yeah to those uh, learn and plays would be something incredible too. So that's sorry, I put, I put that back that's on That's okay, that's a really beautiful segue <laughs> as we're gonna talk about the next thing. So um, we've been throwing around words like Free Tuesday and Sunshine Sunday and, and learn and play and probably, you know, most of you guys know what we're talking about, but a lot of you are going, huh, what is that? On your tables next to you is a beautiful piece. Um, you guys are the first people to have this in hand, um, this kind of booklet that says who we are, what we do, and how to help. This is information on every single program that we offer currently in the museum, everything that we're doing. Um, it has been an absolute labor of love to pull this together, but this will help you understand a little bit more about those programs as you look through it, if there are things that really resonate, we just encourage you to you know, contact us. We'd love anybody who wants to go wit uh, witness a learn and play session, it will absolutely change your day from you know gloomy to bright it is the best infusion of joy you can possibly get um, sunshine sunday likewise just a great opportunity to come in and see families in this beautiful place setting engaging with each other sunshine sunday is our program for children with disabilities uh, just some really great opportunities there so now it comes the time where i make the ask and say you know we are sponsored so much. We are supported by donors like you all over the community. 50% of our funding comes from raised dollars. So 50% of what we do is supported by fundraising. The money raised at this event and other events like this goes directly to support a lot of these access programs that we're talking about. And we haven't even touched the surface. So we have wonderful partners that, that support our learn and play programs, but we are continuing to look at ways to expand and grow those programs in lots of different ways. We have digital access programs for families who really can't get out of the house. We have financial access programs like Free Tuesday, which is supported by the Children's Board, but we also have our Museums for All program, which gives deep discounts to families who are on, um, on, foods, uh, on EBT and aren't able to necessarily pay the full price of admission. All of these things are supported through our, resp our social responsibility initiative, and that is where the money comes today. You have this beautiful QR code. For those of you who are more tech inclined, take a snap of that QR code that will take you directly to our landing page where you can give there. There's also a remittance envelope on your table. The table captains have envelopes and are there to help collect those to raise dollars for us. If you have other questions, we would love to hear from you, helping us to continue to grow family relationships, to grow play in children, to build those babies' brains, connect parents and around our community is really what we do. So thank you all so much.
Thank you again to Joanna for your inspiring remarks. She did an amazing job. Thank you to our play expert, Pam. I really enjoyed Fireside Chat with you. And thank you to all of you for joining us today in a conversation on the importance of play in early childhood brain development. I know this event gave us an all new perspective. Please leave your completed donation envelopes and your name tag in the center of your table and a team GCM member will collect them. And now for their centerpiece giveaway. <laughs> it's a fun part. Uh, one person at each table has a gold star on their program. So check your program, see if you have a gold star. If you have a gold star, you are the lucky winner. <laughs> you got a gold star? <laughs> you got one? Congrats. Congrats to all our winners. Yay. <laughs> And don't forget to take your play items with you. You can show your kids, grandkids, um, things that we used to do way back when. <laughs> and I also want to invite you to stop on levels two and one to explore the museum before continuing about your day. Our team is excited to show you around and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do one more quick thing because I did a talk and we neglected to do this. So you have all sorts of great play things on your table. There's sunglasses, there's fidget spinners, and there's these weird looking ball things. And if anyone needs help making their fortune teller, please let us know. We're all happy to help. We've made a lot of them over the last little bit. Yeah. Stop it. Is it? I didn't know that. All right, so this weird little ball thing, I want to show you guys how this works, because once you see it, you're going to fight over them. You're going to take this little cup, it's got a little stem inside, turn it inside out so that it looks like a flower. Now this is the tricky part. It's not a top, it's nothing like that. I apologize if I hit anyone with this. You're going to hold it straight out from your arm, and you're going to drop it. Oh, mine didn't jump as high. There, Kate's went. So they're really fun once you know what to do with them, but you got to drop them just so. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. We appreciate you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful morning. Please grab another cup of coffee, another roll, another muffin on your way out the door. Thank you.